Word hit our newsroom on September 10th that President Barack Obama would be honoring Staff Sergeant Salvatore Junta of Iowa, the Medal of Honor, our nation's highest individual military award for bravery and valor in the face of death during combat. There's no way I can wear the Medal of Honor for myself. I can't, it's too big for me. I can't, I can't bear that myself, it's not for me. It had been as intense and violent a firefight as any soldier will experience. By the time it was finished, every member of First Platoon had shrapnel or a bullet hole in their gear. Five were wounded and two gave their lives. Sal's friend, Sergeant Joshua C. Brennan, and the platoon medic. Sal's life-saving heroics during a Taliban ambush on October 25, 2007 in the Korngab Valley of Afghanistan are well documented. He was just 22 years old back then. This humble Iowa soldier stationed in Italy when he got the news about the Medal of Honor was soon to become one of just 87 living Medal of Honor recipients and one of the most recognizable names in Iowa overnight. I was like, oh, that's our Sal. Fast forward two months, you could just feel an incredible sense of admiration and respect for Staff Sergeant Salvador Junta, born in Clinton, when he entered the East Room of the White House with the President of the United States. I haven't had the privilege of being there reporting on it all that day. Sal, along with his wife, Jennifer, Sal's parents, Rosemary and Steve Junta of Hiawatha, were all there to watch as the Commander-in-Chief bestowed the great honor on this aisle. It is my privilege to present our nation's highest military decoration the Medal of Honor to a soldier as humble as he is heroic, Staff Sergeant Salvatore A. Junta. Many watched right back here in Eastern Iowa as we brought you the entire ceremony live. Because I've got nothing but admiration for him and appreciation. Because of his courageous actions, Sal Junta will forever be celebrated as an American hero. Staff Sergeant Junta was also inducted into the Hall of Heroes at the Pentagon the next day. I feel the pressure on my shoulders of all these great people that have given everything and they can't be here for the handshake and they can't be here for the congratulations. But I want to say congratulations in a public forum amongst my friends, amongst my peers, amongst my seniors. Thank you. In the face of life-threatening danger makes him a true American hero. I, therefore, Chester J. Culver, Governor of Iowa, do hereby proclaim November 23, 2010 as Staff Sergeant Salvatore Junta Day in Iowa. The day literally belonged to Staff Sergeant Salvatore Junta, who wasted little time heaping the praise on all men and women who serve our country on a daily basis. For those men and women who have given, who have paid the ultimate sacrifice so we can live in this country and we can sit and live in this beautiful state and feel protected here at home, this is for them, to them. Later that night, a homecoming parade in his hometown of Hiawatha, and something never before seen in that small Lynn County community. Sergeant, I'm going to tell you this has never been given to the, any place, anybody uh, before in the city of Hiawatha. This is from this is the key to the city, presented to, by the mayor and the city council to Sal Junta in honor of your selfless service and dedication, which reflects greatly on the people of this city. Staff Sergeant Junta said he will continue his military service at home or in combat if he's asked to do so, reminding all of us that he is just one of thousands and thousands of U.S. military personnel who are risking their lives daily for our freedoms back home. Flash floods and evacuations follow torrential rains tonight. Live Team 7 coverage of the floods of 2008. Good evening everyone, I'm Bob Waters. These are the headlines at this hour. Much of Northeast Iowa is flooded after up to 10 inches of rain in some places over the last 24 hours. Right now, a mandatory evacuation is underway in New Hartford. Flood victims are being bused to Cedar Falls. Parts of Decorah are underwater. A state of emergency is in effect in Mason City. 
These viewer pictures show some of the damage near New Hampton. Cedar Rapids officials are bracing for floods, including making plans to evacuate the Lynn County Jail. Sandbagging is underway in Iowa City, with the Iowa River predicted to reach record levels. And people in many other communities are also coping with floodwaters. And within the last few minutes, we understand emergency crews are going door to door in LaPorte City to alert residents of rising water there. Meteorologist Jennifer Hildreth begins our Team 7 coverage in the Forecast Center. And Jennifer, at this point, the severe weather threat is mainly over, but flooding will be a problem for days. At this hour, Waterloo and Cedar Falls are under siege from the record floodwaters of the great floods of 2008. The next 12 hours will be critical. Over the next 12 hours, the Cedar River will climb, continue its climb to the highest levels in history. The question is, how much damage will it do along the way? How much damage will these floodwaters cause? As the, I'm Ron Steele, good evening everyone. I am in downtown Waterloo, where about three and a half hours ago, Cedar Falls Mayor John Cruz ordered a mandatory evacuation of this entire downtown area of Cedar Falls, where already the record continues to climb. Right now, according to Mark Schnackenberg, the river level at 101.4, the highest in history, Tara. to come to the West Gym on the UN. That is the latest campus. going on in uh, Cedar Falls, a news conference Center going on live on this hour. Campus. We will check in with Bob Waters again in Cedar Falls in just a bit with more. But first, let's do see how flooding is going to affect many people's drive to work today. If you're in Waterloo, police recommend you avoid downtown. Much of the area is flooded this morning. The only way across the Cedar River is the Conger Street Bridge or taking River Forest Road to the Highway 20 Bridge. The good news is it could soon go down. The Cedar River in Waterloo is expected to crest sometime today. Eileen has the details in a minute. I can't tell you what an honor it is to be asked by Iowans to serve as their governor again. Victories and defeats. Decision 2010 brought plenty of both all across the state of Iowa. The year started off with the road to the June primary election as Iowa candidates fanned out all across our state, spreading their message and working hard to get their name known. The first thing we have to do... AWWL co-hosted the very first Republican gubernatorial debate in April in Sioux City. Bob Vanderplatz, Rod Roberts and Terry Branstad faced off in what was the beginning of months of rivalry within the Republican Party. I, as your candidate for governor... Voters in the June primary, though, decided that former Governor Branstad would be the one to take on Democratic incumbent Governor Chet Culver in November as nearly 300,000 Iowans cast ballots in the primary election. The Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court of the State of Iowa. Another hot topic this year was the justice retention vote. I will issue an executive order. Bob Vanderplatz created a group in response to the Iowa Supreme Court's unanimous ruling in favor of gay marriage in Iowa. The group campaigned heavily in favor of booting the justices up for retention, all three of them. Report, yes. Can I interrupt? Representative King, I'd like to No, know. you can't. Uh, you can take your turn. You're going to get one question. That was the scene in late August when Representative Steve King was interrupted by his Democratic opponent. Matt Campbell was asking for a live televised debate and King turned him down. Fundamentally, we need to recognize that it's the market that creates jobs, not the government. Starting in late September, KWWL began a special series of Decision 2010 interviews with many, many candidates. Today, the budget is balanced. My focus will be on jobs. We brought in dozens of candidates in many races for one-on-one -on -one conversations. We talked about many of the big issues, from the economy and gay marriage to Iowa agriculture and education. Our KWWL.com website had biographies on every state and federal candidate running for office. KWWL also brought you in-depth coverage in the race for First District Congress, one-on-one -on -one interviews with third-party candidates, plus a debate featuring Representative Bruce Braley and his challenger, Ben Lang. Then, election night. You may not always agree with everything that I do, but I will always do my best. There will be many new faces in Congress this year. Good intentions don't excuse 
bad policies. You know, some election nights are more fun than others. The face of Iowa politics changed on November 2nd. Terry Branstead became Iowa governor once again, making history for the first time in a half century unseating an incumbent Iowa governor. Republicans have taken solid control of the Iowa House. They also won several key Iowa Senate races. Not much change in our representation in Washington, D.C., however. Senator Chuck Grassley and all the other U.S. congressmen from Iowa were able to hold their seats for yet another term. I think a lot of people were surprised. A Bosnian immigrant, Anessa Katazovic, took down Waterloo's former mayor, John Roof, to fill the Iowa House seat being left vacant by Carrie Burt. However, possibly the most historic part of the decision 2010 night came with the retention vote of those Iowa Supreme Court justices up for retention, including the the Chief Justice of the Iowa Supreme Court, Marsha Turnus, Justice Michael Streit, and Justice David Baker, all booted out by voters, mostly because of that unanimous decision legalizing same-sex marriage in Iowa. So it certainly was an incredible year in Iowa politics. Tim Terry Branstead becomes Iowa governor once again as he's inaugurated on January 14th. Eastern Iowa's only local news in high definition. This is Live at Five. Many of you have already cast your ballots. Others have yet to do so. Right now we're counting down until 9 o'clock tonight. That indeed is when the polls close on Election Day. We start learning the outcome of many of the really critical key elections on this November 2nd. Good evening, everyone. I'm Ron Steele. And I'm Tara Thomas. Welcome to an evening of Decision 2010 coverage on KWWL and KWWL.com. What a day it's going to be. We have Team 7 coverage all over the place. Look at that. Our reporters are spread out all across eastern Iowa tonight. We will have live reports from Des Moines, Waterloo, Cedar Falls, Dubuque, Cedar Rapids, and Iowa City. We start our coverage right now in Cedar Falls at the beautiful Park Place Event Center. That's the headquarters for the Blackhawk County Republicans tonight, and it is also where we find News Channel 7's Kara Mashik. She is live for us. Tell us what you'll be watching tonight, Kara. Oh, well, good evening, Ron and Tara. As you can see here behind me, the stage is set here for Blackhawk County Republicans to have a victory party tonight. Reporting live in Cedar Falls, Kara Mashik, Iowa's News Channel 7. All right, thank you, Kara. We also have our sights set on results in more than 100 other state and county races, including the Hardin County Supervisors race. No incumbents here, six candidates in the race for the two open seats. That should be an interesting outcome, Tara. And the Butler County Supervisors race, this is an interesting one. The incumbent lost the Republican bid in the primary by just one vote to Tom Heidenworth. How about that? So John Zimmerman is running after being nominated by petition, hoping that more people come to vote for him on this election day. The Blackhawk County Democrats, excuse me, setting up at the Waterloo Center for the Arts, and we continue our Team 7 coverage going live to News Channel 7's Lauren Squires. How's it going? Well, hey, Tara, just as you said, this is where the Blackhawk County Democratic Watch Party will take place in just a few hours. There are a lot of races to watch. Now, one in particular is Congressional District 1 incumbent Bruce Braley up against Republican candidate Ben Lang. Now, this race in particular has gotten a lot of attention. That's because Braley had more than $50,000 spent against him from an outside group. And, of course, coming up tonight at 6, we'll hear from both of them, and we'll bring you the results all night right here live in Waterloo. Lauren Squire. Iowa's News Channel 7. All right, interesting stuff. Thank you, Lauren. Of course, Des Moines is a central hub of activity this election day. Both the major candidates for governor, plus Chuck Grassley, Roxanne Conlon, many more are down there. We have three reporters in our capital city covering the events on this election night. We begin as we go live at 5 here to News Channel 7's Danielle Wagner. Danielle, tell us where you are and what's going on right now. Well, Ron, I'm in West Des Moines. It's pretty quiet here now, but an election party is supposed to kick off around 7 tonight. Former Governor Terry Branstad is one of five former governors across the country throwing his hat back into the political ring. Reporting live in West Des Moines, Danielle Wagner, Iowa's News Channel 7. Daniel, thank you very much. I'll tell you what, an expensive race, too. News Channel 7's Colleen O'Shaughnessy is going to be covering events at the Culver headquarters tonight in Des Moines. I'm at the Democratic Election Night Celebration Headquarters here, and several of the candidates will be joining us later as we watch the results come in, including Roxanne Collin. But the person we're focused on tonight is Governor Shet Culver. I right, talk to you soon, Colleen. Turning our attention now to Iowa's second U.S. Congressional District. That is the race between incumbent Dave Loebsack and Republican challenger Marionette Miller Meeks. New Channel 7's Jason Epner continuing our Team 7 coverage live from downtown Cedar Rapids. 
This is especially interesting because it could send a woman to Congress. Yeah, Tara, more on that in a little bit. This is a race that has turned into a very competitive one. You may remember Lobsack and Miller Meeks went head to head back in 2008, and Lobsack won by more than 18 points. Now, the two term incumbent was in his hometown, Mount Vernon, this morning, casting his vote. And the question is, will he get enough votes to hold on? And of course, as you mentioned, Tara, there is some history at stake tonight because if Miller Meeks goes on to win, she will be the first Iowa woman to ever be elected to serve in Congress. More, we'll have plenty more coming up tonight, and we'll get you updated on this very competitive race. Live in Cedar Rapids, Jason Epner, Iowa's News Channel 7. Thank you, Jason. There is one item on the ballot in Iowa City that so many are watching closely tonight. We've been talking about this for an awfully long time, and actually for several years. For think about it, the hotly contested debate, the issue of the city bar ordinance, the 21 ordinance that keeps anyone out of the bars, if they're not 21, past 10 o'clock at night. This has been so controversial. Everybody's been talking about it in Iowa City and Johnson County. News Channel 7's Brady Smith right now is live in our new Iowa City newsroom. And the heart of this thing right now, Brady, the show voters should know, is there something more they should know before they cast their ballots? Many have been there already, but they go till 9 o'clock tonight. Tell us what you have. Well, Ron, tonight's vote to keep that ordinance, that law in place or to overturn it is going to be very, very close, according to some local polls taken around uh, this, this place here. But uh, supporters of both sides are actually worried that their own messages are going to get lost in potentially confusing ballot language. Again, just to reiterate, a yes vote is essentially opposing the 21 only law that's in place right now. A no vote is essentially supporting that law to keep it in place. In Iowa City, Brady Smith, Iowa's News Channel 7. Yeah, Brady, we understand that the students have been coming out in droves voting and trying to turn this thing away. And we'll remember also the same law sent back to the voters a few years ago and was overturned by a rather large margin. I think a lot of people are looking maybe a little closer vote this time, but we'll have to see what happens here tonight because the students could make all the difference too. Voters in the tri-states have a couple of casino questions on their ballot and a big question here in Waterloo too. People in Dubuque deciding whether to keep Pat Murphy in the House, the incumbent speaker challenged by Paul Kern. Now, Becca Haveger is keeping track of things that may turn out for us tonight. I'm here at the Dubuque County Courthouse following several races, including the House District 28 race, where Republican Paul Kern is challenging current Speaker of the House and Democrat Pat Murphy. We're also following House District 27 race, where Republican Hank Linden is challenging current Representative and Democrat Chuck Eisenhart. Now, I'll be here in the third floor courtroom, the North courtroom, following those election results, catching up with candidates, and of course, bringing that all to you. In Dubuque, Becca Haviger, Iowa's News Channel 7. It has been a long time leading up to this day. KWWL, hopefully, as you know, has been the place to go to learn about all the issues. We've brought in nearly 20 of the candidates, the candidates for office right here on our News at 5 during the past several months. There they are on your screen right there online and on the air. We've asked questions and interviews to give you the best pictures of who is on the ballot today so you can cast your ballot and cast your vote, I should say. We've detailed the issue on the ballot in Iowa City, that heated decision there whether or not to get rid of the ordinance banning anyone under age 21 from being in the bars after 10 at night and talking about the environment. Environment. We showed you what that constitutional amendment question is all about. The one asking whether or not to create a natural resources fund for the state of Iowa. KWWL.com, our main website, the place to go for everything election. We showed you how to register, how to register, how to find your polling place today. We've posted a lot of biographies, in fact, biographies on every candidate made it easy for you to get to their campaign websites with links there. And we're ready tonight to bring you the most up-to-the-minute results from your important vote from today. Stay with KWWL all night long, extended coverage of Decision 2010 tonight, election night.